All right, what is up, guys? It is Storm back here with another video, and in this one, I am bringing you part 57 to Legacy and Naruto story. Now, if you want to check this story out for yourself, the link to it will be down in the description below. But before the video begins, if you like the content you're seeing, be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. I mean, they're all free, so why not? If you want some dope channel merch, the link to that will be down in the description below. And if you want to see more of me, go check out my other channels and go follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, which will all be linked down below. But without further ado, why don't we just dive right on in? Konoha. Tsunade was buried in her paperwork, or how the third would put it, the curse of the Kage. It was a deadly curse, that can be assured of, capable of bringing even the strongest of shinobi to new heights of boredom and despair. The legends tell of many brave Kage that stood against this common enemy, and even through armed with years of knowledge, the enemy still stands strong. This is ridiculous, Tsunade muttered beneath her breath as she stamped another worthless, Yet surprisingly detailed D rank report of the well known Catching Mr. Tora mission. She looked up as the door opened and watched as Kakashi lazily strolled in, hand in his pocket and nose buried in his books. Finally, Snotty nearly screamed as Kakashi stopped in front of her desk. If looks could kill, Kakashi would already be dust by the angry gaze on Tsunade's face. I'm sorry I'm late. Kakashi actually looked embarrassed for a change. I met this pretty little snake in the forest, and she wanted to, um, play, so we did. Kakashi chuckled nervously when he noticed Tsunade's eyes narrowing. This pretty little snake wouldn't be Anko by any chance, would it? Tsunade asked and was internally pleased when she saw Kakashi cough into his hand. Anyways, I need a favor from you. Kakashi noticed the business tone and immediately pocketed his precious book. Whatever you command, Lady Okage, Kakashi said. Leave us, Tsunade said. Wavering her hand at seemingly nowhere, Akashi felt three chakra signatures vacate the room. She sent her Anbu away. Whatever it is must be important. Kakashi mused in thought when he noticed Tsunade rest her head on her hands and released a long sigh. Cat is missing, Tsunade said, and Kakashi's eyes narrowed at the possible implications. By cat, you mean Yugao? Kakashi asked. More a statement than a question. Yes, Tsunade replied nonetheless. She got up and turned back to the window, looking at the horizon. She hasn't come for her duties today. Her shift began almost five hours ago. If she was anyone else, I would have dismissed it and proceeded to punch said Anbu for endangering their Okage. You want me to search for her? Akashi asked. There are very few people I trust completely in this village. Yugao isn't just some random Anbu. She's pretty high in the chain of command. Anyone else, we would place him in the bingo book if he went missing all of a sudden, Snotty sighed. She's part of that select group of people I trust, and she wouldn't simply skip a shift of her job without an explanation. I sent a Chuni to her house, and she was nowhere to be found. So, find her, Tsunade ordered. Yes, Lady Okage, Kakashi answered, as he disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Tsunade sat back down in her chair and leaned backwards, gazing into the ceiling. Neither Yugao nor Hayate were anywhere to be found, and both of them weren't some random shinobi. Tsunade was broken from her thoughts when she felt the Anbu return to the room and a knock at the door. Come in, Tsunade said as she adjusted her posture. Tea, Lady Tsunade? Shizune asked, poking her head through the open door. I could use it, maybe it'll wash my stress and problems away, Tsunade replied, and watched as Shizune placed a cup of steaming hot tea at her desk and promptly left the room. Tsunade absently picked up the cup and took a long sip, sighing in bliss as the hot tea ran down her throat. She was in her thoughts when she felt her heart start to speed up with no apparent reason. Her breathing rate started increasing as well, and Tsunade immediately shot up from her chair. She stumbled momentarily as she felt lightheaded and her vision seemed blurry. She rose her arm, desperately reaching for anything to support her she fell to the ground, knocking the cup of tea with her. She fell to her knees, taking deep breaths and trying to calm her beating heart. Poison? Tsunade thought in shock as she brought her shaking hand to her chest. Her hand started glowing green, but was immediately brought to her mouth as she coughed up blood. Why aren't the Anbu doing anything? Tsunade looked up in despair until she heard the door opening slowly. As the door creaked open ever so slowly, she looked up to see Danzo, and surprisingly, Shizune accompanying the old mummy. This, this is <laughs> treason. Tsunade gritted her teeth, her vision becoming blurrier and her breathing starting to waver. Good work, Danzo said, as he watched Tsunade collapse to the ground, drawing her last breath and blood trickling from her mouth. Shizune. Moments earlier, Kumo. The man that wanted the world. I'm going to make a martyr out of you. The world will see you as the fool you were. Are you ready, Fugaku? Naruto asked. Oblivion. 
awaits. Shinra Tensei. A loud voice broke Naruto from his actions as he tilted his head to the side to see some Akatsuki member with his right hand raised. Naruto vanished in a yellow flash, appearing on the other side of the arena next to Hinata. Fugaku received the blast wave head-on and went flying with Nagato's attack, but I suppose sore flesh is better than death. A single Zetsu immediately emerged from the ground and attached itself to Fugaku, patching up his body in a few seconds. Naruto watched with trembling anticipation as the Akatsuki member seemed to pour from the sky. The six paths of pain followed by Konan and Kisame. What a happy reunion, Naruto said happily, clasping both hands and bringing them together to his chest in delight. We have come for you, Kyuubi, a white masked Akatsuki member said. Naruto narrowed his eyes at the white swirly mask open to show Nagato Uzumaki. According to my intel, you were supposed to be physically impaired. But I suppose wearing a Zetsu body is a good replacement, Naruto said offhandedly. And you know very well why you were in that state. Those eyes do not belong to you, Naruto said, his Sharingan boring straight in Nagato. And I shall be taking them when I'm through with you, Naruto added in thought. It matters not. They are just a means to an end, Nagato said, as he stepped forward, placing himself in the middle of his paths. Jiraiya, A. Blue or Tobirama and Green or Hashirama dropped from the Kage box and landed in the arena, or what was left of it after Naruto's match against Hinata. I'm Guru Guru, aka Spiral Zetsu, Guru Guru yelled. Did you have a good bowel movement today? Guru Guru asked with fascination in his tone. W what? Naruto sputtered. You got some balls coming for B, the Raikage shouted as lightning armor roared to life. So, it's true after all. Dry aside sadly. This isn't the path to peace you told me long ago. This world is nothing but a petty child, Nagato stated. But even a foolish child can grow up in a right way when he learns what pain is. Knowing pain controls one's thoughts and decisions. Enough! The Rakaki shouted and his armor flared, lightning straight. A shot forward, crackling the ground as he ran towards Nagato with maximum speed. Nagato didn't even seem to flinch as his pupils seemed to contract ever so slightly. Shinra Tensei, Nagato said with disdain. A was repelled backwards with tremendous force, tumbling through the ground and crashing near Naruto and the others. Attacking head-on is foolish against a Renegon, Naruto warned, helping the Raikage up. Lord Raikage, Naruto said. What do you want, brat? A snapped. Leave them to us. Go take care of your village, Naruto simply said, ignoring the looks of disbelief he got from A. You have your village to defend. Let us take care of them. Hey, kid, A said, snatching Naruto by his collar and bringing him up to his eye level. If they get away or take B, I'll have your head. Do you understand me? A snarled, but Naruto nodded nonetheless. A vanished with pure speed, leaving Naruto to deal with the Akatsuki. A had his troops to rally in the village to defend. Sorry, B, Naruto said, and B looked at him with confusion. But I can't take any chances with you, Naruto said, and before B could say anything, he was warped into his calmly dimension. Let's even the numbers a little bit, Naruto smirked. Summoning Jutsu, Naruto said, and everyone tensed as he placed his hand on the ground. Naruto was unpredictable, and from a simple summoning Jutsu could come the QB or nothing at all. Black, aka Mito. Everyone's attention shifted to the small cloud of smoke. Once it dissipated, everyone could see the black dragon, pitch black armor and mask. Red hair tied into a bun with a very large scroll attached to her lower back. Black is the color of authority and power. Red, aka Kushina. And another cloud of smoke. Waist length blood red hair coupled with red armor and a red mask. A single pitch black katana with a red hilt on her back. The most emotionally intense color. Red stimulates a faster heartbeat and breathing. It is also the color of love. Yellow, or Minato. This time, it was a yellow flash instead of a smoke. Yellow armor and a mask, three-pronged kunai in each hand. Cheerful, optimistic, sunny yellow is an attention getter. Brown, or Gara. Absolutely nothing. No cloud of smoke. No yellow flash. No nothing. Hmm, uh, I guess he's busy, Naruto muttered. Solid, reliable brown is the color of the earth and is abundant in nature. Pink, or now, the newest addition to the group. Light pink colored armor and mask. Long, raven haired, and two twin swords strapped to her back in an X shape. Pink, the color that showed unconditional love but also being immature, silly, and girlish. White, aka Itachi, 
the newest member along with Pink. He was clad in a pure white colored armor and mask. Jet black hair that was pulled back and tied with a red elastic and a low ponytail. White, the color that represented purity and perfection. So, these are the fabled ten dragons of the leaf, or nine, I should say, if Fugaku corrected. I suppose they can be imposing with the armor and masks, Fugaku said, and narrowed his eyes, taking in the aura surrounding both white and pink. Traitors to your own family, Itachi. Now, Fugaku spat. We have two very distinct understandings of what family is, father, Itachi said, shattering his mask on the ground. Long time no see, Toby. Or maybe I should call you Fugaku, Yellow, aka Minato said. And you are, Fugaku asked, raising an eyebrow. Come now, Yellow said, an amused smile tugging his lips beneath his yellow mask. Minato's Sharingan blazed to life, glowing an ominous red behind his mask. In Uchiha, it's just not possible, Fugaku thought, narrowing his eyes when he saw the red glow behind the black holes in the mask. Who are you? Fugaku asked carefully. He knew of no blonde Uchiha's besides Naruto. Are you sure you don't remember me? Yellow, or Minato snarled, deactivating the voice changing seal ingrained in the mask. Minato chuckled when he noticed Fugaku's eyes widening in complete disbelief. Minato laughed, slowly bringing his hand to his yellow mask and dropping it. He showed his face to the real world. He felt everyone looking at him in disbelief, shock, and to some degree, fear. You set my village in flames. You bring death to my people. You force my son into a life of hate, Minato spat, with his Sharingan glowing. Today, you shall bear witness to the full might of Minato Namikaze, son of Mater Uchiha, fourth Hokage of Konoha, Minato said, going through hand seals faster than some could even blink. Rat, ox, dog, horse, monkey, boar, tiger. Fire style, majestic fire destruction, Minato kneaded the chakra into his lungs and converted it into fire. He expelled a massive stream of intense flames, setting the area ablaze and engulfing half of the arena in a sea of flames. Nagato was the first to break from the shock of seeing Minato alive and well. Shinra Tensei. He raised his hand and pushed back the incoming wave of flames. Nagato blinked as there was a yellow flash right in front of him. Nagato still had his hand raised as Minato appeared right in front of him, between Nagato and the wall of fire. Giant Rasengan. Minato smashed his fear chakra against Nagato, who didn't even manage to use his Praetor Path to absorb the Jutsu. Nagato was blasted backwards and chaos ensued. I'll take Nagato. I have no wish to fight his puppets, Naruto said, and everyone charged forward to their enemy. Hinata, grab a sample of Konan's blood. I know Black, aka Mito, would love her origami bloodline. Naruto smiled darkly, and Hinata nodded. Nagato vs. Naruto. Every dragon charged forward, randomly picking an opponent and proceeded to dish the pain, either by iron, bone, or chakra. Naruto and Nagato were no different, and as such, were duking it out between themselves. Give yourself up, QB, Nagato said, raising his hand and releasing another repulsive wave. Naruto simply used his Kamui and dematerialized his body to avoid the attack. I have no intention of hearing your explanations. You and your Akatsuki are responsible for all the bad shit that happened in this world, Naruto growled. Tobi or Fugaku, whatever, I don't give a shit. He released the Kyuubi and Konoha. He drove Kiri into a civil war and he played Yagura like some puppet, butchering thousands of innocents. You and your holy quest for the Biju killed Yugito, attacked the Fire Temple and hidden Waterfall Village, nearly killing Fu in the process, Naruto spat, glaring at Nagato. You won't get any words. The only thing you'll get from me is vengeance, Naruto said. Just as the Sharingan started spinning into the Mangekyo, a Madarasu, Nagato's body exploded with black flames, consuming the white shell of the Spiral Zetsu. Ah! Spiral Zetsu yelled as the black flames started consuming away his body. Do something, he yelled to his guest, his words slurring together due to the pain. Shinra Tensei, Nagato replied, pushing the flames away and dispersing them. Guru Guru's body was singed all over with several black specks spread throughout his shell. Odambara Sengon. Nagato's eyes widened in shock as Naruto appeared right in front of him. Nagato, momentarily distracted from Naruto's previous attack, was almost caught off guard. Pray to path, Nagato said, as a silvery barrier appeared around him and started absorbing Naruto's attack. However, Naruto's frontal assault with a powerful chakra technique was merely a distraction. Nagato sent someone behind him and quickly looked backwards and saw another Naruto speeding towards him. 
a black sword pointed straight at him. Just as the tip of the blade was about to connect with Nagato, a mechanical arm sprouted from his shoulder and caught the blade in his hands. Two more arms appeared from his body, these ones without a hand but what seemed to be a cannon at the edge. Asura attack, Nagato said, each arm aimed towards one Naruto. Both mechanical weapons started glowing and gathering chakra. Just as the arms were about to go off, both Naruto started glowing. Shadow clone explosion, both clones set in perfect sync. They detonated themselves with a deafening bang. Once the smoke cleared, Nagato stood in the middle of the blast zone, arms crossed around his face. He looked around and quickly spotted the original Naruto, sitting safely in a nearby wall watching the fight. His hair waving due to the explosion, an amused expression etched onto his face. Nagato was about to engage when he felt himself stagger slightly. My deep path has fallen. So, Tobirama is also alive. This is troubling, Nagato thought to himself and analyzed his situation. The QB brow was certainly strong, to force him to not only use two paths simultaneously, but to also come out on top. Before he could think anymore, Five more Naruto's burst from the ground, forming a perfect circle around Nagato. Shinra Tensei, Nagato yelled, destroying all five clones at once. Nagato's eyes widened when he caught a glimpse of yellow out of the corner of his eye. Thunder God Slash, Naruto's sword seemed to blur as Guru Guru immediately shifted Nagato's body in his shell to avoid him losing his head. Shinra Tensei, having regained his power again, he blasted Naruto backwards only for him to poof in smoke as well. Nagato felt something hot trickling down his face, and noticed a small trail of blood running down his forehead. He hadn't escaped completely unharmed. He's using the intervals between my attacks. I'll have to be very careful. I cannot blindly use it any longer or I'll end up like my diva path, Nagato concluded in thought, as he looked towards his arm and spotted a black marking. A Raishin seal, Nagato thought in shock, as he quickly absorbed the chakra inside and destroyed the marking. Rainmaker Jutsu. Nagato muttered, raising both hands to the sky, forming dark clouds with his own chakra. It was mere moments later that heavy rain started pouring down around both figures. I cannot solely rely on my vision to track him, Nagato thought as he connected with the rain. He turned to Naruto's location only to see him still sitting in the wall, looking at Nagato with curiosity. Naruto rose and jumped to the ground, arms crossed and standing face to face with Nagato for the first time since the battle. Bancho Tenin Naruto rose from the ground and flew straight towards Nagato's awaiting arm, mere inches away from contact. Naruto triggered his Kamui and simply phased through Nagato appearing behind his back. Lightning fist. Running electricity through his right arm and going into his fist, Naruto punched Nagato's back. It sounded like a thunderclap. Nagato gritted his teeth from the impact as his body was blasted forward. Nagato twirled midair and landed on the ground safely. A black spiderweb pattern on his back where Naruto had struck. Inferno style, great fire annihilation, Naruto said, unleashing a wave of black flames. Nagato instinctually raised his hand but stopped before he used his gravity attacks. Instead, Nagato placed both hands on the ground and raised a vast wall of rock to block the incoming flames. He felt the powerful flames smash against his wall but it managed to hold against the initial impact. What's this? Nagato thought in confusion, when he heard a small buzzing sound coming from the other side of the wall. Wind style. Rasen Shuriken. Nagato's eyes widened when the wall in front of him cracked open, and everything was enveloped in a towering dome of spiraling wind chakra. Shinra Tensei, Nagato bellowed, blasting everything around him backwards. The earth was torn apart, sending chunks flying everywhere and dispelling Naruto's attack. Using the rain, Nagato searched for his opponent, his vision clouded by the debris of his latest attack. Nagato caught a small glint in the middle of the dust and immediately chuckled. A golden chain buzzed through his ears, missing him by a few inches. Nagato rolled to the side as another chain shot from the smoke coverage. Wind style, gale palm. Nagato clapped his hands together and released a powerful gale. Not enough to be destructive, but good enough to push all the dust and smoke away, clearing his field of vision. Naruto stood in the middle of the battlefield, arms crossed, completely still and with several golden chains dancing ominously behind its back. Nagato summoned a mechanical arm and launched dozens of mini rockets, whistling their way towards Naruto. Boom, boom, boom. Rocket after rocket crashed on the ground near Naruto with loud explosions. Nagato stopped his attack and waited for the dust to settle, searching for any signs of Naruto. From the dust came six chains, 
heading straight towards Nagato who began evasive maneuvers. Nagato jumped, ducked, and rolled as the chains chased after him. One chain smashed against the ground and dug itself. Nagato jumped on the chain and ran above it towards Naruto. Shinra Tensei, Nagato yelled outside of the dust cloud, releasing a shockwave at point-blank range. Nagato watched as the chains retracted against the will, the metal creaking as it bent against its will. The ground rippled and the dust cloud was disrupted, making Naruto appear from the inside. Nagato watched as the repulsive wave washed over Naruto with no visible effect. Human path. Nagato tried to place his hand on Naruto's head, only to phase right through it and end up on the other side. Nagato caught Naruto's elbow on reply and flung Naruto into the air. Naruto disappeared mid-flight and appeared on the ground a few yards away. I have to find a way to neutralize his Kamui. Nagato mused in thought. The Sharingan is an amazing dojutsu, isn't it? Naruto rhetorically asked as he had a wild idea come to his mind. He crossed both arms behind his back and nodded to Nagato. Come, Naruto said with a smirk. Nagato's eyes twitched at Naruto's blunt disrespect for him. People rely too much on ninjutsu and genjutsu. Very few people appreciate the art of taijutsu and kenjutsu. It's one of the things I love about Hinata. Both of us like getting all close and personal with the adversary. Naruto grinned as Nagato arrived near him. Naruto tilted backwards as Nagato threw a left jab and crouched when Nagato added a horizontal kick. Naruto grinned and pushed forward, ramming his head straight into Nagato's stomach. As Nagato momentarily stumbled, Naruto rose and performed a perfect roundhouse kick, sending Nagato spiraling and crashing into the ground. Nagato shook his head, getting rid of the dizziness that lingered. He looked up to see Naruto with his arms still behind his back and jumping lightly on the ground, alternating his feet with each jump, almost like skipping but without a rope. Nagato snarled and ran forward, arriving near Naruto and throwing a series of punches and kicks. Naruto's Sharingan glowed as it predicted every move, a small tilt backwards to avoid a punch, a sidestep to the right, a forward lean. Nagato went for a leg swipe, forcing Naruto to jump into the air. Naruto leaned his body backwards placing himself horizontally in the air and spraying his legs forward, slamming both feet against Nagato's chest. Nagato went flying and Naruto fell to the ground with a simple thumb sound. Naruto rose his head slightly and watched Nagato rise to his feet, wiping his busted lip with his arm. Nagato got tired of being pushed around like some ragdoll and slammed both hands on the ground. Earth style. Bedrock coffin. Multiple sections of rock rose around Naruto's lying form, trying to wrap themselves around his body and bury him permanently. Naruto grinned and raised both legs into the air. He brought them down quickly, transferring their momentum into his upper body, forcing himself to rise and land perfectly on both feet. Without missing a beat, Naruto jumped in time for the rock slabs to slam where he previously was. Naruto dashed forward and jumped high into the air. Nagato tracked him in the sky and rose his arm as Naruto landed beside him. Shinra Tensei, Nagato yelled, hoping to catch Naruto off guard and blast him away. He had no such luck as Naruto used his Kamui to simply avoid the attack. Naruto grinned and twirled around, trapping Nagato's extended arm with his chin to his chest. Naruto used Nagato's arm for leverage and swung his legs upwards, pinning Nagato's head between them. With the small flick of his body, Nagato was jerked violently into the ground his head first and the rest of his body following shortly. Naruto disentangled himself from Nagato and jumped backwards to gain some distance. Your taijutsu is sloppy, Naruto commented. All the physical exchanges had been with his arms crossed behind his back. How about this, Naruto said, stomping his feet into the ground and bringing both his arms forward. I won't move from this place, Naruto offered, closing his hands into his fists and waiting for Nagato. Nagato rose from the ground and flexed his neck, satisfied by a few crack sounds. Nagato looked up and for the first time, saw what an opponent Naruto truly was. He wasn't an ordinary S-rank shinobi that had a single deadly technique like Dator's bombs, Hidon's immortality, or Sasori's puppets. No. Naruto was a different kind of S-rank shinobi. The kind that didn't rely only on his bloodlines and powerful abilities. He was a shinobi that had all the traits of a shinobi mastered to their peak. His kenjutsu and bojutsu were deadly, his taijutsu flawless, his genjutsu perfect, and his ninjutsu unmatched. He truly deserved the title of the god of shinobi. It's useless, Nagato, Naruto said, breaking Nagato from his inner musings. You may have the Renegon and be a powerhouse, but all that power is meaningless against someone like me. 
You were too slow to face me, Naruto taunted, striking the ego of the so-called god. Nothing will stand against me, Nagato replied, not even slightly angered by Naruto's words. I may not be able to hit you, but this village will not be able to run, Nagato said as he started floating and shot into the sky. It took a mere second to reach the highest point in the village. Nagato looked down at the village and Naruto, feeling that they were in their right place, beneath him. Nagato's chakra spiked as he stretched his arms outwards, making the sky around him turn a piercing white. He's too far away. I won't make it in time before he blows up the village. Naruto racked his brain for answers. He should have finished Nagato instead of playing around with him and seeing his mastery over the Renegon. Naruto was about to unveil his Renegon to counter Nagato when another wild idea came to his mind. Uchiha! Naruto roared, slamming his right hand on the ground, each finger carrying small chakra flames. Uchiha Flame Formation! A pure red cylindrical barrier rose from the ground and circled around Nagato, placing him in the center. The barrier wasn't overly large. It stood a few feet away from Nagato, completely surrounding him. Cho Shinra Tensei, Naruto whispered, releasing his attack at maximum power. The sky glowed a reddish-white, a combination of Nagato's attack and Naruto's barrier. The barrier creaked, almost like plastic, as it stretched around Nagato. The power of his attack forcing the barrier to expand like a balloon. Nagato poured more chakra into his technique, intending to destroy the barrier and level the village, including everyone in it. That fool, he's going to kill himself, Kurama said. Nagato was pouring too much chakra into his technique, and the barrier was stretching to its limits. The amount of energy inside the barrier was insane, and it wouldn't matter who won in the end, Nagato or Naruto's barrier. Boom! A shockwave reverberated through the village, shaking it to its foundations but otherwise not damaging it. The barrier itself exploded like a balloon, with Nagato still inside. There was a large cloud of smoke high in the sky where Nagato was. Naruto lifted his hand from the ground and looked up to the sky. He looked at the fingertips and watched as the skin sizzled to full health. He had poured too much chakra into the barrier without any type of preparation. Naruto saw something leaving the smoke cloud and plummeting to the ground in a freefall. Naruto narrowed his eyes and watched the form of Nagato falling down. His external zetsu shell, aka spiral zetsu, aka guru guru, completely gone, most likely decimated in the explosion. Nagato grunted as he hit a building and finally came down, tumbling to the ground as he came to a halt near a rock. Nagato struggled to move, pushing himself up with only his arms. He looked over himself and noticed that the zetsu shell for mobility was gone. No! Nagato gritted his teeth, willing his legs to move but only getting a small twitch. Even if his legs were to move, they would never serve his purpose. Their muscle were weak and atrophied. Nagato struggled but managed to look up to see Naruto approaching. It won't end like this, Nagato roared with a rage-filled voice, slamming both hands in the ground. Summoning, Gedo Mazo. Naruto stopped his progress when he heard Nagato's words. His eyes widened when he saw a humanoid hand burst in the ground and try to stomp him. It didn't take long for his decayed-looking body to come out of the ground as well. This is... Kurama's eyes widened when he saw the humanoid figure appear. A loud roar could be heard. The Ghetto Mazo rose from the ground with Nagato sitting on top of its head. I will show you the power of God, Nagato said, having regained his breathing. The Ghetto Mazo kept still as Nagato started pouring his chakra into the statue, making a translucent purple dragon to form on its mouth. Bring me into this, Naruto, Kurama said from his den in Naruto's mindscape. No, I don't want you to get sucked into the statue, Naruto replied, and Kurama reluctantly agreed. Besides, he's killing himself. He's feeding the statue his own life force. He may be an Uzumaki, but still, he's human, Naruto replied. I suppose it's time I showed you the true power of my Sharingan, Naruto said to Nagato, who stood on top of the Ghetto Mazo statue. The Renegon will be my trump card should I ever need it, Naruto thought as his Sharingan started glowing. There are some things that I keep secret from nearly everyone. Only Kurama and Hinata know everything about me, Naruto chuckled aimlessly. You will be my first enemy to bear witness to the full might of my Sharingan. I'm going to show you why the s rank title is meaningless against me, Naruto said, as his chakra spiked and a silver aura surrounded his body. Behold, my perfect Susano. And with that, his chakra seemed to roar and come to life. Naruto's body was immediately shrouded by a large cloud of bubbling silver chakra. Only his eyes remained visible, glowing that blood-red color that haunted so many shinobi. 
Naruto's aura shot to the sky and started taking a humanoid form. The only thing Nagato could do was look up and pray he wouldn't end up beneath the foot of Naruto's Susano. Stabilizing, Naruto thought as his perfect Susano started taking shape. His Susano was a translucent silver specter, almost looking demonic. Its form had long, shaggy white hair that reached its waist, with two massive white horns protruding from its head and two featherless wings from its back, pitch black eyes with fangs instead of teeth, and twin scythes strapped around its back. In all honesty, it looked like a visage of the Shinigami himself, if it wasn't for the massive size it had. Tell me, Nagato, Naruto said from the inside of his Susano. Naruto looked like a small dot on his Susano's forehead. Do you feel like a god or an ant? Fugaku vs. Minato. Ready for round two? Minato asked, bending his knees and readying his three pronged kunai. He had hundreds stored away in his wrist seals, ready to use at any time. You can't be him, Fugaku stressed having difficulty believing the man in front of him could be the fourth Hokage. I watched him die, Fugaku stressed his words. Does it really matter? I'm here now, and this time nothing will save you from me, Minato said, twirling his kunai. <laughs> Fugaku chuckled at Minato's empty words. If I remember correctly, you died last time we fought. Really? Minato asked in curiosity. I remember shoving a Rasengan up your ass and sending you away with your arm melting, Minato taunted. So, he really is him, Fugaku thought, hearing Minato's words about their last battle and found them to be true. Naruto is right about you, Minato said, breaking Fugaku from his thoughts. You could have applied all that power you have to the leaf. You could have brought the Uchiha clan into greatness. You could have had everything. A good life. A respectable position in the village as a clan leader. But that wasn't enough, was it? Minato asked, shaking his head in disappointment. The world is barely enough, Fugaku replied. I won't stop until the whole world belongs to me. Fugaku growled and was about to step forward, when he noticed a shift in Minato's eyes. They were spinning. The tomos blurring together and forming a whole new pattern. Mangekyo? Fugaku asked in disbelief as he gazed into Minato's glowing eyes. I always hid my heritage, Minato chuckled. Both as a request from my father, and by fear as well. Fear of being rejected in the village I grew to love so much. I never really trained my eyes and simply left them in the background. I only used my Susano once, and it was when I sparred with Kushina and she went berserk, Minato reminisced. But not anymore. Minato's tone suddenly became furious and his face hard as stone. It's time I embraced my heritage as an Uchiha and wielder of the Sharingan bloodline. Minato smirked when he noticed Fugaku gulp. Minato shot forward, cracking the ground and leaving a trail of dust behind. Fugaku watched as Minato approached him, his Sharingan seeing the enemy incoming, frame by frame, like a slow motion movie. Minato was a few feet away and Fugaku's eyes started spinning. Ten feet. Fugaku's eyes were picking up speed, the tomos becoming nothing more than blurred lines in a sea of red. Five feet. The black circle in his Sharingan started taking the form of three stretched triangles evenly spaced around the pupil, making it similar to a pinwheel. Two inches. Combo- Bang! Minato's fist collided with Fugaku's face as he was thrown backwards. Fugaku tumbled through the ground but quickly regained his footing. He got up a little and wiped a little bit of blood dripping from his lips. Fugaku brought his hands to his chin and with a sickening crack, he reset his jaw. You're faster than I remembered, Fugaku commented. It had been a mistake relying on a Sharingan since it took a small time frame to switch to the Mangekyo. I grew lax in my time as Hokage, Minato admitted without shame. The job will do that to you, although fighting against my son really placed things in perspective. Oh? Fugaku raised an eyebrow. How so? He asked curious. He's beyond any of us, Minato chuckled softly. Naruto is everything he ever wanted in the son and he turned out like that all on his own. Well, maybe Hinata did help with the mold. Wood style, Fugaku said, clasping both hands together. Deep forest creation. Fugaku finished as the ground started grumbling. Dozens of trees grew from the ground. Their branches seemed to obey Fugaku and immediately dashed towards Minato at great speeds. Minato's Sharingan glowed softly, his eyeballs moving wildly, tracking every single branch of the incoming wave of trees. Minato sidestepped a branch, avoiding it by a mere inch. Not by luck or chance. Everything had been calculated. 
He's nowhere near Hashirama's level of skill with the wood style, Minato thought. Looking at the forest replica in front of him, Hashirama was able to create a forest in the blink of an eye. Let me show you something that Naruto taught me, Minato said as he jumped backwards, avoiding another tree and landing on some branches. Fire style, Minato began, stretching both arms forward and his hands inches apart. A small ball of chakra flared in between his hands. It was small at first, but quickly started gaining size and turning dark orange in color. His right hand forming and shaping the spinning sphere of chakra, his left hand changing that chakra into fire type. Great flame Rasengan, Ninoto finished, unleashing his Rasengan upon the forest and flashing away to safety. Fugaku's eyes widened as he activated his Kamui and swirled away, just in time to avoid the maelstrom of raging fire. It looked like a tornado, burning through the forest leaving nothing but ashes behind. Minato placed his hand in front of his face, shielding himself from the brightness and the blazing heat. Once the attack had calmed down, there was no surprises. The tree had been turned into charcoal, covering the floor in black dust. Minato dropped to the ground, his feet raising a small cloud of the black charcoal as he landed. His Sharingan snapped to the left as he caught movement, clang. Minato instantly raised his right arm, a three-pronged kunai made its way to his hand as he parried Fugaku. Minato tilted his body and went for a kick. Fugaku caught him by the ankle and sent him a punch in retaliation, which Minato blocked, making them both hit a standstill. Kamui, Fugaku thought, making the space in front of him swirl, intending to send Minato to his pocket dimension, and leave him there until he perished. Fugaku watched with glowing relief as Minato was completely absorbed into his dimension. You lose, Fugaku said to no one. I told- Ah! Fugaku screamed as Minato appeared out of nowhere right in front of him and punched him in the gut, followed by a kick to his head, sending Fugaku tumbling through the ground. Before Fugaku could understand what happened, Minato was already upon him once again with the Rasengan inches away from his chest. Rasengan! Minato smashed his blue sphere only for it to phase right through. Fugaku had just used his Kamui in time. Both jumped backwards and Minato watched with anticipation for something to happen. Boom! Out of nowhere, Fugaku was blasted backwards, crashing into the ground with enough force to break the earth. That bastard. The Minato absorbed was a clone, Fugaku snarled and thought as he coughed up blood. He looked up to see Minato watching him calmly, so calmly that he felt a sinking feeling in his stomach. Your trick was a one-time shot. I won't fall for that again. Fugaku ripped off his shirt, completely ruined the Minato's Rasengan. Minato watched as Fugaku's shirt drop to the ground to reveal a pure white chest, almost completely made out of Zetsu. How far would you go for power? Minato asked in disgust. The body of the Senju and the eyes of the Chia do make a rather nifty combination, Fugaku said, his hands blurring through hand seals. Fire style, great blaze ball. Fugaku exhaled a meteor-sized sphere of fire, completely blocking Fugaku from view. I don't have any seal out of reach of that attack, Minato thought as he saw the gigantic sphere of fire approaching. I guess it would come out eventually. Minato smirked to himself as his body was enveloped by a yellow flare. Boom. The fire sphere collided with Minato and exploded into a shower of fire. Bugaku watched with satisfaction as Minato's form was enveloped in flames so hot that rivaled Minato's last fire Rasengan. What the? Bugaku said in complete disbelief. When he saw Minato's form simply walk out of the debris, right through the ring of flames like he felt nothing. Minato's body was completely yellow, and that wasn't his armor. It was like his body had some type of yellow cloak, chakra flames covering his form. It seemed he had some ethereal yellow armor around him, but skin tight. You like, Minato asked, as two ethereal kunai formed, one in each hand. This is my version of Perfect Susano. A skin-tight armor that sacrifices all offensive abilities for the ultimate defense. I doubt even a tailed beast bomb could crack my version of the Susano. Minato smirked at the panicking face of Fugaku. How? Fugaku simply asked. Naruto knows more about the Sharingan than you could ever hope to. Minato said as he readied himself to end this battle for good. He was about to jump forward and both of them felt the village rumble. They looked up and saw a big figure. He summoned the Ghetto Mazo, Fugaku said shocked. Is Naruto really pushing him that far? Fugaku thought in disbelief. He was completely surprised when another figure appeared in front of the statue. Fugaku's eyes widened when he spotted the perfect Susano of Naruto. It was massive to say the least. It even dwarfed the Ghetto Mazo and that was saying something. Don't you see it? You can't win, Minato said. 
as he bent his knees and prepared for his final jutsu. His Susanoo may be nearly indestructible, but it ate a lot of chakra, and he didn't have a chakra supply like Naruto. Are you ready, Fugaku? Minato asked, breaking Fugaku from his shock. Fugaku didn't know what came over him, but for the very first time in his life, he felt fear. It hit like a ton of bricks. He couldn't win. He would never be able to win. Everything he had ever done was pointless against someone like Naruto. The third and last level of my horizon, Minato said, and Fugaku could only watch as the ground around him lit up like a Christmas tree. Dozens, if not hundreds of horizon seals riddled the ground, the dislodged rocks, the walls, everywhere. Dance at the flying thunder god. And with these simple words, Minato began his onslaught. Fugaku immediately triggered his kamui and could only look in despair as dozens of Minotos appeared around him. Fugaku took a step back to avoid getting slashed by a kunai. He tilted his head only to see another Minato coming for him. He used his kamui to dodge and nearly screamed in fright when another Minato appeared in front of him. And that was when it hit him. Minato was using Hiraishin at such great speed that even Fugaku's Sharingan couldn't track him. He was moving so fast that it seemed there were multiple Minatos coming at him from all directions, when in fact, there was only one. 10 seconds. Fugaku gulped when he felt his Kamui ability stretching thin, but he couldn't do anything. He couldn't even make hand seals because he needed his fingers to become tangible, and he knew Minato would slice them off in a blink of an eye. Zero seconds. Minato noticed a slight shift in Fugaku's chakra network and took immediate action. The first move would be crippling him. Minato flashed near Fugaku, who didn't even seem to flinch in acknowledgement. Minato slashed with his kunai, beginning in his left eye, crossing the bridge of his nose and ending in Fugaku's right eye. Ah! Fugaku screamed as he dropped to the ground. He clutched to his face, blood dripping freely into the ground and his eyes completely destroyed. Fugaku didn't get to scream much more as Minato flashed in front of him and finished him with the point-blank Rasengan to his chest. Fugaku's body ripped through the ground as the blue sphere drilled into his chest nearly tearing his body apart at the instant it hit him. Minato lost track of Fugaku as he dropped to his knees, his Susanoo vanishing and taking deep breaths. His chakra stores were empty, his Susanoo coupled with the final level of the horizon for it so long had taken its toll. Minato had done his part in this battle, and he proceeded to flash to safety, to rest his body. Konan vs Hinata Do you know what you are doing? Hinata asked. I have received the will of God, and I must kill you. Any last words, little girl? Conan asked in her traditional neutral and cold voice. Bring it, Hinata replied. Shikigami no Mai, Conan said, her body and clothing turning into small sheets of paper the size of exploding tags. Two white wings materialized behind her back, made completely of said paper. Conan flapped her wings, raising into the air and diving towards Hinata. Just as Conan was about to make contact, Hinata triggered her water body technique and dropped into a puddle of water, letting Konan fly by harmlessly. The water quickly moved its position, making Hinata reappear on the other side of the battlefield. Konan waved her arm towards Hinata, making hundreds of exploding tags burst from her arm and fly towards her. Hinata used her Byakugan and noticed that the tags were coming from all directions, cycling around her and preparing to detonate. Protective 8 trigram 64 palms, a similar version to the Chitin technique but far more effective against Conan's attack. Hinata's hands glowed a soft blue. To the naked eye, it would just be that. But to anyone with a dojutsu or enough talent in sensing, they would be able to notice extremely thin, sharp chakra blades protruding from each of her fingers. Hinata waved her arm downwards, slicing dozens of bomb tags and turning them into worthless pieces of paper on the ground. Hinata's arms were picking up speed, looking almost like blurs and forming some sort of barricade around her, similar to the chitin but with chakra blades that sliced anything that came even near it. As time went on, the tags started decreasing in number by the dozens, and in just a couple of seconds, they were nearly reduced to dust in the ground. Damn, Conan huffed in annoyance. Her attack should have been enough to finish her, but apparently Hinata's reputation as an S-rank shinobi was well earned. Conan blinked as Hinata was suddenly at her face in a burst of speed. Conan quickly found herself on the defensive against Hinata's vicious strikes with both power and speed. Hinata went for a palm thrust into Conan's chest only for Conan to burst into hundreds of pieces of paper. The pieces of paper swirled around Hinata as they flew off and slowly started clotting together, giving Conan's form back. Conan blinked as she stumbled backwards, barely avoiding an array of Senbon. The needles were so small and were thrown with such remarkable speed and precision that she nearly got hit. Heavenly kick of pain. 
Hinata came down from the sky, her heel hitting against Conan's back and smashing her into the ground in a large explosion. Hinata watched as Conan's form wavered as she fell apart into sheets of paper. Her Byakugan caught a blur and Hinata jumped away, avoiding several paper shurikens. Hinata twirled around and blasted forward. Conan's eyes widened when Hinata closed the distance in the blink of an eye and all she could do was bring her arms up to shield herself. Smash! Conan was blasted backwards, crashing to the ground until finally coming to a halt. Hinata took a senbon and took a small blood sample from the ground where Conan had been. She quickly sealed the senbon in her wrist seals and waited for Conan to get up. Conan dug her way out of the rubble and spat blood to the ground. She had enough with the Hyuga girl. She was going to end her now and go to help Nagato against the QB brat. Conan was about to unleash her ultimate technique when she felt a change in Hinata. Your aura has changed, Conan commented with curiosity. It's called Senjutsu, Hinata began. Her purple markings around her face seemed to glow with energy. By absorbing natural energy and finding the proper mix with the physical and spiritual energy that makes chakra, I can create a new mixture called Senjutsu Chakra. You would need to feel it to truly understand it, Hinata said softly, with clear passion in her voice. The thing Senjutsu Chakra allows. It's truly amazing and scary sometimes. Naruto only uses Senjutsu to boost his own power to levels that can defy logic, but I am more subtle about it. To me, Senjutsu isn't only about power. The medical applications of Senjutsu are limitless. I can forcibly inject it into a chakra system and completely petrify a person. Or, I can use it to push my bodies to levels I never reached before, Hinata said seriously. I can regenerate vital organs instantly, regrow limbs in a matter of seconds, push my body to the ultimate level by opening the eight inner gates and live to tell the tale, Hinata laughed softly. Raising her hand into the air, the purple marking spreading around her like a snake, the power of the world in the back of my hand. As long as I have chakra, I don't fall in battle, Hinata said as her Byakugan flared to life once again. The world around her lighting up like a fire, her eyes able to see the natural energy around her, running through the ground like endless rivers, flying in the wind like flocks, running deep in her veins like blood. The possibilities with Senjutsu are endless, and I've just begun to truly understand how chakra really works, Hinata said, ever so slowly lowering her right. Like this, Hinata said, and slowly tilted her head. Conan's eyes widened when her hair seemed to increase to impossible lengths, and before she could think of a proper response, Hinata's hair wrapped itself around Conan, pinning her wings to her back. Without a hand seal or anything else, Hinata's hair started rotating midair until it whiplashed Conan to the ground at neck-breaking speeds. Conan flexed her paper wings to break the fall, but even that wasn't enough to stop her momentum, as she crashed into the round, making it crater from the impact. <coughs> Conan gritted her teeth coughing, momentarily losing control of her origami bloodline and her body returning to normal. Conan's hand was holding her shoulder as if she let go. Her shoulder would drop to the ground. With a sickening crunch, Conan pushed her shoulder backwards, placing it in the right place. You won't stop Nakato's vision, Conan said with vigor as she raised her arms to the sky. This time, it wasn't hundreds, but thousands of exploding tags coming out of her arms. Her breathing started to get heavier as her chakra level started to drop lower and lower, her ultimate technique taking too much out of her. Paper Ocean Jutsu, Conan said, as the thousands of paper tags seemed to swarm Hinata and start to spiral around her body. Even if you transform into water, you won't get out of this alive. I have prepared this technique should Toby ever step out of line. Any last words? Conan asked. Yes, Hinata said. Locking eyes with Conan, her Byakugan blazing, you followed the wrong god. Sage arts, petrifying eyes. Hinata said as her Byakugan seemed to give off a silver pulse. Conan suddenly drew a harsh breath as foreign chakra flooded her system and started overwhelming her. Hinata was about to finish her technique and petrify Conan forever when both Kunoichi felt the village tremble. Hinata stumbled and dropped her eye contact, making Conan fall to the ground. Coughing and taking a series of quick breaths, Nagato! Conan yelled at the blinding light in the horizon, where she knew Nagato was fighting against the QB kid. Conan jumped into the air, pouring the remnants of her chakra into forming her paper wings. Conan quickly flew off with Hinata running after her. Kisame vs. White, aka Itachi. We meet again, Itachi, Kisame replied, grinning like a madman. It would appear he would get the battle he always wanted. 
So it seems, Itachi replied. People say I'm a shark, Kisame said, shrugging his shoulders. And sharks have to eat, Kisame finished, picking up his blade that seemed to shiver with excitement. Looks like Samehat has taken a liking to your chakra. Maybe it was all that time we worked together. Water style, rain, water, shark, wave, Kisame said, flashing through hand seals and slamming his hand in a nearby pond. The water rose into the air and formed several large water sharks. Itachi didn't move from his place and simply took out five kunais with exploding tags attached. With a single hand, he threw all five kunai at each shark mouse with deadly accuracy. Five explosions with the sound of Kisame's technique being defeated. Kisame just smirked when he noticed the explosion. All that water in the air simply reformed into more sharks. Although these ones were smaller, they were far more numerous. Kisame jumped into the air and brought Asame Hata downwards, trying to smash Itachi. Just as the sword was about to make contact, Itachi exploded into crows that circled Kisame and reformed not far away. Kisame grinned and swung Asame Hata backwards, hoping to catch Itachi off guard. A single kunai flew into Itachi's hand, and with dexterity, he simply blocked Kisame's swing. Itachi was flung backwards due to Kisame's raw strength but landed safely on the ground. Both dashed forward again and met in a flurry of punches. Itachi threw a kick only for Kisame to bring his sword to the front and block it with ease. Minutes later, both Kisame and Itachi found themselves struggling against each other, Samehara clashing against a simple kuna in a battle of strength. Itachi's eyes widened as he jumped backwards when Samehara seemed to become alive and ripped through the bandages that hit its real form. I told you, Samehara isn't a simple sword. Kisame grinned as he began hand seals. Water style, water shark bomb jutsu, Kisame said, thrusting his hand forward, hurtling giant water made chakra at Itachi at high speeds. Fire style, great fireball jutsu, Itachi jumped backwards to gain some room as he took a deep breath. He released a powerful ball of fire that crashed against the incoming shark, both techniques neutralizing each other into a cloud of steam. Kisame took Samehata by the handle and scanned his surroundings for Itachi, the steam clouding his vision. You lose. Kisame's head twitched ever so slightly as Itachi seemed to shimmer behind him and place a simple kunai at his neck. You really are a prodigy of the Sharingan. Kisame laughed, not at all intimidated by the kunai at his neck, but I think you underestimated me. Kisame grinned, bursting into water as another Kisame appeared behind Itachi, this time placing Samehara at Itachi's neck. Kisame felt a small spike in Itachi's chakra and almost bubbled with excitement. So, you're gonna use those eyes, Kisame asked, not needing to see the mangekyo in Itachi's eyes. I already was. Kisame's head did a 180 and saw another Itachi looking at Kisame with a neutral face. The Itachi at Kisame's mercy only shimmered out of existence. No water, no smoke, no crows, like it was never there to begin with. Impressive, Kisame said, lowering his blade and looking at Itachi carefully. You got some new eyes, I see. A gift, Itachi simply replied. How about we end this right now, Kisame asked. Our most powerful jutsu against each other, Kisame offered and Itachi simply nodded. Itachi's eyes began glowing as Kisame began working through a long chain of hand seals. Water style, super water shark bomb jutsu, Kisame shouted. Thrusting both hands forward as a gigantic shark barreled towards Itachi, his massive jaws open and ready to swallow anything in its way. Itachi was enveloped by an orange glow, signifying the use of his Susano shield. In just a few seconds, Itachi was completely surrounded by his fully formed Susano, complete with the sword on its right hand and his shield on its left. Yadamir, Itachi simply said, putting his red shield forward. The Yadamir, an ethereal red shield that was rumored to be endowed with all five nature transformations, capable of negating any type of opposition, whether it's spiritual or physical. The rumor was about to be put to the test as the massive water shark approached. The shield lived to its expectations as it didn't even buckle when the water shark crashed upon it. Taking use of Kisame's shocked face upon seeing his strongest ninjutsu attack, negated it like it was some little pawn trick. Itachi took his Totsuka blade and thrust it forward, piercing through Kisame's chest. Kisame didn't scream out in pain or anything. Perhaps he was still shocked, or maybe he just didn't feel anything. Itachi. It seems that in the end, even a shark gets eaten. Kisame said as his form started to crumble, and he was absorbed into the sword, sealed for all eternity. Blue, aka Tobirama vs. Diva Path. Why do you follow the QB brat? The Diva Path asked in its monotone voice. 
because I believe in his ideals. He and I, we are both realists. We see the world as it is, not as we'd like it to be. Blue, aka Tobirama said, and he, unlike my older brother, doesn't think this world will know peace with friendly talks and by playing nice. He will reach peace, one way or another. Blue finished. I see, the diva path replied, narrowing his eyes. Who are you? He asked with simple curiosity. No real need to know. My name matters not. I'm the man that will support Naruto to the best of his abilities. And if that includes killing you, then so be it. Blue, aka Tobirama said, clasping his hands together in a prayer sign. Water style, great exploding water wave, Blue said as a spiraling vortex of water appeared in front of him. The vortex exploded from the top, coming down against the diva path in the form of a gigantic wave. Shinra Tensei, the diva path raised his hand, pushing the wave backwards. The remaining water circled around the repulsive barrier. If Nao's information is correct, he should have a small interval between attacks, Blue thought as he watched the water calm down, and the diva path lowering his arm. Blue flexed his right wrist, making a pop sound followed by a small cloud of smoke. Blue took the handle of whatever came out of the store seals and channeled Shocker through it. The handle seemed to roar to life, forming a blade of sparkling yellow light. It's the first time I've ever laid eyes on the Sword of the Thunder God. If I remember correctly, it belonged to the second Okage of the Leaf, Tobirama Senju, the Diva Path said. Not the slightest impressed by the legendary sword. Not belonged, Blue said, bringing his hand to his blue mask. Belongs, Blue said dropping the mask to the floor and showing his face with three red markings and shaggy white hair. Tobirama Senju, the diva path simply said, taking in the man in front of him. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised by your appearance seeing that the fourth is also alive and well, the diva path stated. Water style, severing wave, Tobirama spewed a highly compressed jet of water. The jet ripped through the ground like a knife through hot butter as it approached the diva path. Shinra Tensei, the diva path shouted. The water jet collided with the shield, splashing like water on a hard floor. Tobirama immediately dropped his attack and threw a few kunai. My power isn't ready yet, the diva path thought, tilting his head to the side and allowing the kunais to fly by harmlessly. Flying thunder god slash, the diva heard a voice behind and quickly turned around, only to catch a glimmer of yellow as the Raijin no Ken, aka the flung thunder god, detached his head from his shoulders. Thump. The diva path's head rolled to the floor as Tobirama turned off his sword. Some god, Tobirama muttered, as he walked away to help Kumo deal with the invading force of Zetsus. Red, aka Kushina versus Praetapath. Another one, the Praetapath said, his running on boring straight into the red dragon. You have Uzumaki Chakra, the Praetapath commented with slight curiosity. I'm related to Mita Uzumaki after all, Red replied, shrugging her shoulders. I have red hair like the real you. My Uzumaki genes are dominant, but doesn't matter. Don't expect mercy in my hand just because we belong to the same clan. You want my s- Kushina stopped mid-sentence as she was about to reveal her identity. Forget it, Red said, unsheathing her sword from her back. Futon no Yoroi, Red said, her body gaining a small blue aura around her, almost invisible to the naked eye, but like a light bulb to the Renegon. Chakra wave, Red flicked her sword releasing a blue crescent wave of chakra towards the Praetopath who held his ground. The Praetopath allowed the Juchi to hit him head on, only for the technique to disappear upon contact. He completely absorbed my attack. It must be the Praetopath, Red concluded in thought, deciding to resort to more physically oriented attacks. It was lucky that she was a more physically oriented fighter. Even with her slender frame, she still packed quite a punch. Red took a deep breath and allowed her body to relax. Her aura began to shut down as she dropped her wind armor. No use in wasting chakra when the enemy could simply absorb it into his own reserves. Red buckled her knees and shot forward, leaving a trail of dust. Red swung her sword, the blade whistling as it cut through the air with ease. The Praetopath instinctually ducked and jumped backwards to gain distance from his opponent. He himself wasn't an offensive path, but more of a defensive one, and against a fast and powerful opponent like the Red Dragon. The Praetopath found himself troubled. The Praetopath quickly found himself on the defensive against Red's unrelenting attacks and vicious strikes. Red narrowed her eyes when she saw a black metal rod appear from the Praetopath's hands and parry her sword. Both weapons clashed with a resounding bang. Orange sparks flying as both metals grinded against each other in a battle for supremacy. Red took a single hand from her sword and pointed it straight at her opponent. 
The Praetopath noticed a small glint in her palm. His eyes widened and he immediately pushed himself backward as a golden chain sprouted from her hand, grazing his cheek and drawing a small line of blood. Chains as well. Is she related to the Cuby brat as well? The Praetopath mused in thought, struggling to dodge the incoming chains that seemed to increase in number as time went on. The Praetopath couldn't do much against such an opponent in desperate times come desperate moves. The Praetopath pushed forward, dodging a few incoming chains as he made his way towards Red, who was stationary while using her chains. The Praetopath spread his arms, making black rods sprout from each hand. Red raised an eyebrow as the Praetopath jumped into the air and flexed both rods at her, hoping to enter quickly. Red tilted her head in confusion as two chains shot from near her feet and wrapped themselves around the rods, snapping them like rotten wooden twigs. Red swung around her and smashed her foot into his chest, sending the Praetopath sailing through the air and landing harshly on the ground. The Praetopath looked up and quickly rolled on the ground to avoid a volley of shurikens. Chain style, Red said, placing both hands on the ground and looking up towards the Praetopath. Chain forest, Red said, as the ground started to rumble ever so slightly. Hundreds of chains burst from the ground near her hands as they made their way against the Praetopath. The chains seemed like snakes, slithering their way to their target. The Praetopath could only look in horror at the incoming amount of chains. He knew that it was the end for him. He could never dodge that amount of chains, no matter how hard he tried. So, he simply accepted his fate. The chains wrapped themselves around his arms and legs ripping him apart in a matter of seconds. Green, aka Hashirama vs. Animal Path. Summoning Jutsu, the Animal Path wasted no time in talking to the Green Dragon. There was a big cloud of smoke as the ground started quaking. A giant rhino burst from the smoke, stomping his way towards the Green Dragon who was already going through hand seals. Wood style, laughing Buddha Jutsu. Gigantic wooden hands erupted upwards from the ground. These hands quickly wrapped themselves around the incoming rhino halting his progress and pinning him to the ground. The animal path slammed both hands on the ground, bringing forth more summons. This time a loud shrill filled the air as the summons shot from the smoke and high into the sky. Green was momentarily distracted with the bird summon that he didn't notice the ground beneath his feet start to crack. A giant centipede burst from the ground, sending Green flying to the air but he landed gracefully a few feet away. Looking at the rhino, Green forced his wooden ninjutsu upon his enemy, making the wooden hands clench around the animal. The rhino groaned in pain until he burst into smoke. The bird gave another shrill as he looked down upon him plummeted towards Green. He jumped backwards as the bird crashed into the ground, the bird's beak drilling into the earth. Green was still mid-air when he felt the earth rumble. He looked backwards to see the large centipede burst from the ground and open its mouth. The centipede gobbled Green in the blink of an eye and closed its massive jaw. Wood style. From the centipede's mouth came the muffled voice of Green as several spikes of wood emerged from the ground. These spikes impaled the centipede in multiple places, raising him into the air like some piece of meat on a stick. The summon burst into smoke, letting Green land safely on the ground. Green looked towards the animal path who was on top of the bird's head, out of Green's reach for now. Summoning Jutsu, the animal path muttered, another cloud of smoke, followed by a large brown-colored dog with a chakra receiver stuck through its head. A loud roar could be heard. The dog bared its fangs and charged forward the ground shaking with each step he took. Green held his ground, his hands blurring through hand seals faster than the average eye could follow. Wood style, wood dragon jutsu. A big wooden dragon with glowing yellow eyes burst into the ground. The wooden dragon coiled like a snake before springing forward at high speeds. The dragon sneaked through the incoming dog's body, wrapping itself around his legs and bringing him to the ground. The dog howled in pain, his snout meeting the hard ground when his legs were tied up. To Green's surprise, the dog didn't disappear in smoke with that crash. No, in fact, the dog somehow split into two and rushed forward once again. Green didn't stop to ponder what had happened and sent two more dragons forward, one for each dog, and the same thing repeated itself. The dog crashed into the ground and proceeded to split and slip through the dragon's grasp. It seems that I can't defeat that summon, Green mused and thought as four dogs charged at him. Wood style, four pillar prison jutsu, Green said. The ground grumbled in this time, not caused by the approaching summons. Green took his time, letting the dogs approach him until they reached the intended spot. Several timber pillars shot from the ground, forming a perfect square around the dogs. The dogs whined as they crashed into the wooden walls and proceeded to split once again. Although, this time they would not be going anywhere as they were confined inside the wooden prison. Time to end this, Green thought as he looked at the sky, watching the impassive face of the animal path. 
wood style, deep forest emergence. Dozens of trees rose from the ground and this time, they didn't stop at that. The trees continued growing to almost impossible heights as they went after the bird in the sky. The animal passed eyes widened when he saw the gigantic trees approaching, and immediately began evasive maneuvers. Excellent, Green thought as he watched the animal path getting distracted with the trees. Green clasped both hands together and waited patiently as several red markings spread across his forehead and cheekbones. Sage Art, Gate of the Great God. Two massive red tori fell from the sky. The animal path was busy dodging the trees and didn't realize the danger coming from above. Each tori landed on one of the bird's wings, bringing him down to ground level with a loud crash. The animal path jumped as the bird crashed into the ground and disappeared in smoke. He was about to summon more when the trees wrapped themselves around his form. It's over, Green said, dropping down from the trees and landing in front of the animal path. Nothing will stop me, the animal path said before Green removed all the chakra receivers, making the body fall to the ground dead. He was already dead, but this time, he wouldn't be a puppet anymore. Pink, aka now, versus the Osiris path. Now dropped her mask onto the ground. It was no use hiding her face and identity when Fugaku just told the whole world who was hidden behind it. The old hag won't be happy about this, now grinned to herself at the thought of the old Senju hag rambling. Traitor to your own family, the Ostrapath said, several mechanical contraptions bursting from his body. Fugaku was the traitor, now spat back, not appreciating being called a traitor. He killed my sister just because she didn't follow his orders blindly like the rest of my pathetic clan, now gritted her teeth. She hoped that Minato was giving Fugaku what he deserved. We were great, you know, once, but Fugaku drove us into this quest for power, and in the end, he ruined us. It's interesting how a single person can influence the world. Now sighed sadly before looking up and looking at the Osra path, knowing that Nagato is listening behind this puppet. And he will do the same thing to all of you, now warned. He only cares for himself. He doesn't share your goals, Nagato. You want peace. The only thing he wants is control over everything, and he will kill anyone that tries to oppose him. I think you are mistaken about me now, the Ostropath said, a slow chuckle escaping his lips. Even I know there are no loyalties in the Akatsuki. Everyone is in there for themselves. Some for art, some for money, power, others just for fun. But in the end, they all did what I ordered, the Ostropath replied and his weapons readied themselves. Just like you, the Osiropath pointed out, emphasizing each word as his head seemed to open to reveal a cannon. He started gathering energy just before unleashing a powerful chakra blast. Now dropped her head, her eyes finding the floor. I know, now said softly, ignoring the incoming missile of chakra. I had my fair share of sins to atone for, and I think this is a good beginning, now said, taking both swords from her back. Now raised her head, her eyes bearing a look of fierce determination. She extended both arms forward and sliced the incoming chakra ball with ease, making it explode right in front of her. She raised a single arm to her face, shielding her eyes from the heat of the blast. Her Sharingan caught movement through the cloud of smoke and she immediately jumped backwards. The ground where she stood exploded when a small missile landed on the ground. Now looked up to see several more missiles heading towards her. She turned around and started running from them. She looked backwards to see that the number of missiles had diminished, but the remaining ones seemed to be tracking her. Now placed a single sword in her back and used her free hand to take out several shurikens. With precision, only the Uchiha clan was known for, the shurikens hit the missiles, destroying them right in midair. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. Now took a deep breath and released a powerful fireball that burned its way towards the Asura path. He remained in place as the blast of fire crashed upon him. Now narrowed her eyes when she noticed that the Ostropath took the jutsu head on but seemed unharmed. As the smoke cleared, the Ostropath stood unharmed. His traditional Akatsuki cloak was ruined, leaving him bare skin from the waist up. Instead of the traditional pink color of skin, the Ostropath's chest was nearly all silver in color, with several metallic plates. Damn. Now thought when she noticed that her fire attack did nothing but melt his clothes. She would need more heavy, powerful attacks if she wanted to break through the shell of his. Genjutsu was out. Taijutsu was well, since she didn't have enough raw strength to break that kind of metal. Ninjutsu it is, now thought with a grin. Her Sharingan slowly spinning and her black tummo blurring together to give birth to her eternal Mangekyo Sharingan. She shivered when she felt the usual rush of chakra into her eyes. 
Only Shinobi with Dojutsu could ever relate. It was like scratching that itch that really wasn't painful, but it was enough to be uncomfortable. Perhaps she was just liking to use the Sharingan, or maybe it was the enhanced vision that came with it. She took a deep breath and pushed those thoughts away. She was in the middle of a battle and even the slightest of distractions could prove deadly. She slowly rose her eyelids, the world around her lighting up. She blinked as she watched dozens of incoming missiles, courtesy of the Osura path. Now stood her ground, watching the incoming missiles approach ever so slowly, one inch at a time. Her eyes started releasing a soft reddish glow as a purple aura manifested around her body. She took her last sword and cautiously placed it on her back, as if it was a too hard of a movement they would break. The swords were one of the last remaining links she had to her sister, along with her eyes. It barely took a second for her Susano to roar to life, shielding her body from the incoming threat. Now watch as the first missile hit her Susano's shield and simply squashed itself like a mosquito in a window. The same fate happened with the following missiles. They didn't even scratch the surface of her ethereal shield. Now Susano grew in size, manifesting itself to its full height. A single vibrant red-colored sword appeared in her right hand. Now flexed her own hand and the Susano gripped the sword tighter. Now cocked her arm backwards and pushed her sword forward at blinding speeds. The Osura path dodged to the side and replied with several chakra blasts that crashed upon her Susano. While powerful in its own right, the Osura path didn't have the weapons necessary to break through now its ultimate defense. Another swing in the Osura path started running away, letting out small chakra blasts and the occasional missile. Now closed her eyes and took a deep breath and deep concentration. She snapped her eyes open, immediately locking its position. A Madarasu. A wave of black flames exploded on the Osura path who fell to the ground. Now narrowed her eyes when she saw his bones shifting under his skin. The arm burning with the black flames of a Madarasu simply fell to the ground, like some disposable object. She watched as another mechanical arm took its place like nothing had ever happened. Looks like I need to either destroy his body completely or take out the chakra receivers. Now mused in thought as she watched the Osura path point his arm at her, and forming a fist. His fist detached itself from his arm before rocketing towards her. Boom. The fist missile crashed against your Susano, and yet again, nothing but smoke. This is getting nowhere, now fell with disappointment. They were at a standstill. Her only way of winning was to destroy his body with her Susano, but he was too slippery for her to hit him. Flame body, now thought, dropping her shield and channeling fire chakra through her body, making it explode with fire. She bent her knees before throwing herself forwards towards the Osra path. Fire Fist. Her right fist glowed a dark orange as she swung her fist at her opponent. The Ostra path simply tilted backwards, watching the trail of flames her fist left behind. Now thrust her left arm forward. Fireball. A small fireball exploded from her arm, hitting the Ostra path straight in the head. Knowing that such an attack wouldn't stop his mechanized body, she rose her leg to kick him. The Osura path swiftly caught her leg by the ankle and threw her away like some ragdoll. Now twisted midair and landed safely in the ground. Her eyes started glowing once again and her reddish aura of fire started darkening into a menacing pure black. A Madarasu no Yoroi, now said, standing there with her body completely covered in a Madarasu flames. She's feeding her chakra into the flames to stop them from burning her. The Osura path thought and prepared is now blurred forward. Inferno style, swirling death. Now arrived near the Ostra path and unleashed a flurry of kicks and punches so fast that the Ostra path was finding himself pushed back. He couldn't block those attacks or he would be hit with the powerful black flames. Inferno style, raging fire. The Ostra path's eyes widened when now unleashed a wave of black flames from her arms. The Ostra path pointed both arms forward and released a couple of chakra blasts to dispel the attack. He watched as the flames fell to the ground and started eating away the rock. Now swung her arms wildly and watched as a ring of fire appeared in the battlefield, trapping both shinobi inside it. It didn't take long for the flames to grow tall and easily block their view of the outside. You won't be going anywhere. Now smirked, flexing her arms. The ostrapath scoffed at her pointless threats. He was, after all, a dead body, being reanimated with the six pass technique, and should he ever be destroyed. Nagato could easily put his body back together. Shurana Ko. The Ostra path unleashed a couple more chakra bombs. Now twirled, avoiding a ball of chakra and swiftly ducked another one. Now rushed forward, taking out both swords in the process. Inferno style, fire slash. Now swung her blade and unleashed a black crescent wave of chakra. 
Now watch as her attack connected and chopped off one of his arms only for it to regrow once again. Now took a deep breath and channeled all the chakra she could into her leg and sword. Her swords took a darker aura, causing the black flames to increase in size and heat. She looked up and locked eyes with her target just before whispering her ultimate kenjutsu technique. Inferno style, flame blade assassination jutsu. Her body shimmered out of existence. The Yasuo's path's eyes widened when he felt the surge of power, and completely lost track of now. He felt the small air displacement behind his back, and immediately turned back. All he caught was seven streaks of black before now disappeared once again, back to her original position. Now smirked as the Yasuo's path fell to the ground, in a mix of severed limbs. Seven precise and incredibly powerful strikes, one to take his head, one for each arm, one for each leg, and two more to his chest essentially leaving nothing but chunks. With the final Amaterasu, she left his body to slowly burn to ashes. Outside of Konoha, this isn't very graceful, yeah, Daedara said tired of waiting the trees hidden from sight. Be quiet, Daedara, Sasori reprimanded. Both the Koski members were outside of Konoha walls, waiting for their contact to arrive. The problem was that both of them had rather short tempers and waiting wasn't something either liked to do. I'm just saying, these tree huggers have no respect for art, Daedara grumbled. Sasori was about to reply when two shinobi dropped in front of them. Daedara and Sasori, Torune asked. We are here. Don't keep us waiting anymore with worthless questions, Sasori replied harshly. Both root shinobi said nothing but merely started walking towards Konoha with both Akatsuki members in tow. This way, Torune said, leading his group through a more quiet entrance other than the main gates. Tarune and Fu led the Akatsuki members through the barrier that covered Konoha without raising any type of alarm. Where are our marks? Sasori asked, making both root members stop walking and turn to stare intently at Sasori. We do not need to remind you of our deal with Lord Donzo, do we? Fu asked with a dangerous tone in his voice. We will keep our end of the deal. We'll draw the attention for the dragons and Akumo in exchange for the Biju, Sasori explained and Fu nodded, resuming their path towards their objectives. Minutes later, both Akashiki members and the two root shinobi were standing outside of the Senju compound. They were standing a bit away so they didn't get detected. My bugs tell me that the dragons are still in there, along with the Ichibi and the Nanabi, Toruna said. Let's go then, Daedara said, rising from the ground but was stopped by a hand on his shoulder. Don't be foolish, Fu warned. There are five seal masters living there. Anyone not authorized to enter the compound would be reduced to ashes, before he could even cry in pain. We must wait for them to leave. I will interrupt the Ichibi from getting called, and from there you will take charge. Understood? Torune asked, and both Dator and Sasori nodded. With Kakashi. Kakashi was jumping from rooftop to rooftop, his form blurring through the buildings as he made his way towards Yugao's apartment. A few minutes later, Kakashi found himself standing at her front door. Unlike other shinobi, Yugao had a small apartment in a building shared with civilians. Yugao was one of the few shinobi whose house buildings were shared. Most shinobi preferred their privacy and usually lived in single, separate houses. This, of course, didn't apply to the clans. Then again, clans were usually big families and not random strangers all living together in the same buildings, split only by a few walls. Kakashi knocked on the door and waited patiently for a reply. Seconds quickly turned into minutes and Kakashi knocked once more. Getting no response, Kakashi leaned in, placing his head on the wooden door and listened for any sounds coming from the interior. Strange, Kakashi thought as he kneeled on the ground standing a few inches away from the door lock. He went to his pockets and retrieved a small case, no bigger than his own hands. He set the case in the stone floor and quickly unrolled the fabric to reveal a few shining metal tools. Kakashi nearly felt like whistling as he took a thin metallic lock pick and introduced the tool into the lock. Kakashi listened and felt for the clicks as the lock pins were placed in the right place, allowing the tumbler to rotate freely. Kakashi pocketed his tools and opened the door. The first thought that came through Kakashi's mind was amusement. Shoes tucked away in a corner, two swords hanging neatly in a nearby wall, a small shelf filled with books, no empty room for more, and surprisingly enough, no books lying around the house other than the bookshelf. Still the same old perfectionist, Kakashi thought to himself walking towards the room and silently opening the door. A Sharingan came to life as he gazed in the darkness of the bedroom and saw nothing more than an empty bed. Kakashi went to check the remaining rooms but found no evidence of Yugao. All of her clothes and equipment were still here, so he rolled out defecting. Kakashi was closing the door out of the apartment when his nose caught a familiar scent. Hayate. That explains her absence in her home. 
Kakashi thought with a grin as he closed the door and made his way towards Hayate's house, where he was sure he would find Yugao. It took only a couple of minutes for him to reach his new destination. Hayate's house was an ordinary house, but unlike Yugao, Hayate lived alone in the building. Kakashi approached the door and like any good neighbor, he politely knocked on the door and waited for someone to answer. Kakashi's eyes narrowed when he smelled something metallic. Blood. Kakashi concluded as he took a step back and kicked the door open, blasting the wooden door right off the hinges. The house was a mess to say the least. There was blood everywhere and signs of a small battle. Kunai and shurikens on the floor and walls. The tables were destroyed along with the chairs. Pieces of the wall on the ground. Kakashi quickly searched the house for any signs of Yugao or anyone else. The amount of blood that was sprayed around the apartment was too much for someone to survive. He chose to follow his nose, trailing the scent of blood to its source. Kakashi quickly reached another door, presumably to Hayate's bedroom and decided to take caution. Something had happened here and it wasn't pretty. Kakashi stealthily approached the door and slowly pushed it open, the wooden frame creaking ever so slowly. Yugao! Hayate! Kakashi shouted as he saw his two comrades lying on the ground, in a pool of their own blood. He quickly rushed to their side, hoping that they would still be alive. Kakashi gingerly brought a finger to their neck and sighed in relief when he felt a pulse. A weak one at that, but a pulse nonetheless. Kakashi. Yuga muttered weakly, barely able to part her lips. Hayate seemed to be in an even worse state, completely unconscious. They were lucky to have fallen unconscious with their wounds facing the floor, somewhat stemming the blood flow. Kakashi did a quick overall scan of the room and found another person lying in a nearby corner with a sword driven through their chest. An assassin, Kakashi mused in thought, noticing a single white mask on the attacker's face and simple Anbu clothing. Shadow clone jutsu, Kakashi said, making a clone of himself and hoisting Yuga over his shoulders. With one hand applying pressure to her wounds, Kakashi's clone did the same with Hayate as Bolt dashed towards the hospital. During their way, Kakashi made another clone to inform the Okage that someone had targeted her bodyguard. While Yugao was a jonin and one of the best, there were far more likely targets for an assassination inside the village. Everyone knew that Yugao was an Anbu, but a mere few knew that she was the Okage's bodyguard. Just thinking that someone had found their identities and made a move on them was troubling enough. With Akatsuki and Root, now, Torune shouted as the four members stormed the Senju compound. Garo was about to respond to Naruto's summon when a swarm of bugs burst from the ground, ripping through the wooden floor. Wind style, great breakthrough. Garo took a deep breath and unleashed a powerful gust of wind, breaking the swarm and pushing the insects backwards. Without a second thought, Garo jumped towards the window, smashing the glass and ending on the outside of the Senju compound. Sand started flowing freely from his wrist seals as it started crushing the flying bugs. Bugs are a specialty of the Operamic clan and Fu, Garo thought in confusion. As to the person responsible for this attack, Katsu! Garo's eyes widened when a white bird appeared right in front of his face and started glowing. He barely had time to shield his face as he was blasted back, his sand skin cracking slightly due to the explosion. Garo cursed beneath his breath as he twisted midair and landed on the ground. Boom! The ground beneath Garo's feet suddenly exploded, covering his form in smoke. All done, Daedra smirked coming down from the sky on top of his clay bird. His cocky smirk was quickly wiped from his face when the smoke cleared and instead of a battered Gara, he found a solid cocoon of sand in its place. A Katsuki, is it? Gara asked rhetorically as the sand cocoon opened slowly to show his neutral face. You are either very brave or very stupid to attack one of the five great elemental nations in broad daylight, Gara said, stepping on top of a small chunk of sand and started floating in the air. Huh. <laughs> Data was not happy his plan hadn't worked. Now he had to actually fight the Ichibich in Cherokee. Looks like my plan failed. Data grumbled in disappointment. Garo was about to reply when they felt the ground start to rumble. Garo's eyes widened when he felt the massive spike of chakra and his head snapped to his left, just in time to see the wall of the Senju compound being blasted open by a small tailed beast bomb. Bastard! A deep voice came from inside the compound as Sasori came running from inside. Fu stepped outside slowly, in her five-tailed Chinchuriki state, piercing green eyes, dark blue chakra cloak. The ground cracked as Fu shot forward, heading straight towards Sasori. Gara's eyes followed Fu as her biju-empowered fist crashed into Sasori's form, obliterating the Akatsuki member into pieces. They are not alone, Fu. Be careful, Gara warned, remembering the swarm that nearly overwhelmed him earlier. Let me out, I want to play, Shukaku yelled from inside Gara's mind. This is no time for jokes. They're attacking us and Konoha isn't responding. Fu's attack should have drawn a lot of attention, Gara replied, and Shukaku frowned. 
I haven't used this body in years. A voice broke over from his thoughts as his eyes turned to the new voice. Sorcery of the Red Sand. I wondered when you would show your face to us, Gara said. You are well informed, Gara, Sorcery replied, stretching his wooden limbs. We know more about your organization than you could ever hope to think, Gara said. Fu slowly made her way towards his side as more sand started pouring from his store seals. Fu, are you in control? Gara asked towards his partner in Biju form. Yes, Fu snarled at the Akatsuki members. Go, Gara said. Raising a wave of sand as Fu roared and dashed forward. Daedara's bird quickly flew high into the sky, out of range from Gara's sand. Sasori disposed of his Akatsuki cloak to reveal his puppet body. From his back came several metal blades that blocked Fu's punch. A loud roar could be heard. Fu roared, releasing a shockwave that pushed Sasori backwards and cracked the ground from the pressure. Sasori skidded through the ground until he stopped. Damn. Sasori sighed beneath his breath as he took his favorite puppet. Things weren't supposed to be like this. There wasn't supposed to be a battle in the first place. Iron Sand Rain. Sasori's puppet, also known as the third Kazakage, opened his mouth, releasing a cloud of black grains of iron. Iron Sand Gathering. The iron sand started compressing into high density shapes, the size of small houses as they hovered in the air. With a flick of a wrist, Sasori commanded his puppet to send the barrage of chunks of iron towards Fu. Fu watched as the weapons of iron quickly approached and she bent her knees. Disappearing from her position with a loud swoosh sound, Sasori took an involuntary step back when he lost track of Fu. He caught movement in the corner of his eyes and formed a metallic sheet of iron in front of him, just in time to block a biju-powered fist from Fu. Her punch connected with Sasori's defense with a loud bang, the sound reverberating through the air, a testament to both the power of the strike and the sturdiness of Sasori's shield. Katsu! Deidara yelled as dozens of white clay bombs surrounded Fu and exploded. Deidara narrowed his eyes and scoffed when he noticed Fu completely enclosed in sand, protecting her from the blast. A loud roar could be heard. Sasori's eyes widened in shock when the sand dome opened and a bright glow emanated from the inside. Beach you dama! Fu released a tailed beast bomb at point blank range. When the smoke cleared, there was no puppet or puppeteer to be seen. Fu took a whiff of the air and her head snapped to the sky where she saw Daedara flying on his bird with Sasori next to him, with a missing arm. We cannot fight them head on, Sasori said, looking at his missing arm. They have too much raw power for either of us. In that case, Daedara grinned as his hands flew to his bags and his legs. He took out a big chunk of clay and started molding it. Seed 3, Daedara yelled, throwing his creation into the sky. With a single hand steel, his creation increased in volume, taking the size of a small building and started plummeting to the ground. Gar's eyes widened at the sheer magnitude on the incoming clay meteorite. A bomb of that size would destroy a chunk of Konoha, Gar thought in panic. Raising his arms to the sky, sand started pouring out of his wrist seals like rivers. Giant sand shield, Gar said, as the sand started covering the Senju compound. A giant shield started forming itself mid-air right on the path of the incoming explosive. Boom. The explosion lit the sky and Gara grit his teeth, pouring more power into the shield to protect the village from the blast. Once the explosion had cleared, Gara took a deep breath as he fell to his knees. He poured too much chakra into the technique to defend the village. Give some chakra, Gara said to Shukaku, huffing as he kneeled on the ground for support. Now you want my help, Shukaku snarled as Jinchuriki. Please, Gara said and Shukaku scoffed. Fine, but it'll take a while to replenish your chakra reserves, even with me helping, Shukaku replied, and allowed some of his chakra to seep into Gara's network, slowly refilling his reserves. Whoa, Dator shouted, forcing his clay bird to bank left all of a sudden as a tailed beast ball barely grazed them. Dator started evasive maneuvers as Fu started firing multiple Bijudamas against the bird, trying to bring them to ground level. She looked towards Gara and saw him slowly regaining his breathing. Gara! Gara's attention turned to the incoming voice as two Anbu squads arrived at their position. Reinforcements? Daedara asked, rhetorically. It was bound to happen with all the ruckus he made, Sasori said towards Daedara who huffed in defiance. Doesn't matter, Daedara grumbled. Let's just take the Jinchurikis and be done with this. Help her, Gara said, slowly regaining his breath. Gara watched as one of the Anbu group dashed after Foon before Gara could explain what was happening. One of the Anbu slapped a Biju suppression seal on Fu's body. Fu roared as Chome's chakra was suppressed and the link to her Biju closed off. What are you doing? Gara yelled as the remaining Anbu squad tried to do the same with him. Gara was lucky to have his sand that automatically pushed the Anbu back. Gara's mobility was still impaired by the heavy usage of chakra and he didn't have many options left. 
Whoever these Anbu were, they were working with the Akatsuki. Garo is forced to jump backwards as the Anbu group engage defensive actions against him. What is happening? Gara thought as he dodged another sword strike. His eyes turned towards Fu's unconscious form, her body being loaded in a daterous bird. Kona has been compromised, and the rest of the group is drawn into another battle, Gara thought, pondering his actions. Two Akatsuki members, along with eight Anbu members, were too much for him now that he was drained. Gara did the only thing he could in this situation. He channeled what shocker he had available and shunshuined away from the battlefield. Hey, Dator yelled when he noticed Gara disappearing in a tornado of sand. The Ichibi is running away. Forget about him, Dator. We'll use the Nanabi as bait. He'll come for her, Sasori explained. But Dator grumbled nonetheless before accepting the facts. Sasori jumped on top of Dator's birds the two flew away from Konoha, knowing that Gara wouldn't take long to come after them. With Gara. Gara canceled his Shinshuin due to the lack of chakra, arriving a few miles away from the Senju compound and collapsing against a tree, taking deep breaths. He looked over his shoulder, scanning his surroundings for any possible shinobi. He could trust very few people if Konoha's Anbu had been compromised. Gara looked at the sky and noticed a white bird hovering around Konoha and flying away. Gara strained his eyes at the bird itself and saw Fu's limp form of the bird. I'll need help, Gara said out loud before dashing towards the only place he knew he would get help to rescue Fu. What's taking so long? Gara asked towards his biju. Well, excuse me for not being able to flush your system with chakra like the QB, Shukaku snarled. Just keep giving me what you can, Gara replied, trying to avoid conflict with the raccoon and his mood swings. Gara stood up, having regained his breath and run off towards the Abrame compound. The Shunshuin was out of question. He had used what little he had left to get away from the Akatsuki. Abrame compound. Push them back into the woods, Shibi yelled to his clan. All of a sudden, his compound was being swarmed by two Anbu squads. Insect tornado, Shino said as the bugs surrounded the enemy and started spinning around them at high speeds. As the tornado was spinning, each bug took a bite of each one of the Anbu. It was mere moments later that the Anbu were all but disintegrated. It's done, Shibi said, taking deep breaths and falling to his knees. Ah! Shibi suddenly began yelling in pain and fell to the ground, squirming in pain. Father! Shino yelled, rushing to his father as well as some of the clan members. What's happening? Some member asked, clearly wondering what was happening to their leader. Shino laid his father flat on the ground and ripped his chest closed to display a growing purple spot in the middle of his chest. Renikaichu, aka the Phosphorus Destruction Insect, Shino simply said, ignoring the gasps of everyone around them. Renkaichu are a rare breed of nanosized venomous insects that destroy the body's cells, causing excruciating pain in the process. Take him to the hospital. It's too late for that. You would never make it in time, Shino replied, ignoring the protest of the rest of the clan. Sh Shino, Shibi gasped, reaching for his son and bringing him closer. The, the clan, it, it's up to you, Shibi whispered, dying in his arm and dropping limp to the side. The Abarame clan, a clan that valued logic above all, a clan that taught each member to bury emotions, to remain objective in the field. Even after being taught all that, Shino couldn't help but let out a small tear. Damn it. Shino swore, punching the ground. Report the attack to the Okage, Shino said, but neither member moved. Now, he snarled, startling everyone around him. The members scattered to fix the damage that had been done to the compound and to report to the Okage. Shino sighed and picked his father's body up. He didn't need to worry about the Rinkaiju since they went on and destroyed themselves once the host they fed upon had died. Shino quickly made his way towards the compound. A small walk, but it felt like miles. Shino arrived near his house and looked as the door opened. Shino? A female voice appeared on the other side. No, she whispered when she saw Shibi's limp form being carried in his son's arms. Shibi, she yelled, rushing towards them. Shino stopped and lowered his father to the ground, allowing his mother to envelop Shibi in a desperate hug. Sorry, Shino said, his voice raspy and dry. It took us by surprise, and one of the attackers was us, Shino whispered, watching his mother swallow herself in grief at the death of her husband. He's, he's in a better place now, Shino offered, feeling completely helpless. He had already accepted his father's death, and was trying his best to help his mother. Stop rationalizing everything, his mother yelled, her eyes red with tears. He was your father, and you can't even spare a tear in his honor. Do you even feel anything for us? His mother asked. I would sacrifice anything for my family, Shino replied instantly, 
and immediately snapped to attention. Stay behind me, Shino ordered, feeling a presence rapidly approaching the compound. His eyes looked around until he caught Gara approaching and the first thing he noticed was his state. Sweat dropping from his face and his chest weaving heavily. What happened? Shino asked, shouldering Gara so he didn't fall to the ground. Akatsuki, Gara replied, and Shino was immediately on alert. They took Fu, Gara said softly, and Shino's heart sank. First his father, and now Fu. Where? Shino simply asked, but Gara noticed a slight edge in his voice. Gara looked to the ground and his eyes widened when he saw Shino's father dead. You were attacked as well, Gara said, and Shino nodded. Looks like it had been a joint attack on the clans of the village. Gara could only speculate on the goal of everything. Rest, Shino said, and lowered Gara to the ground. What are we going to do? Gara asked, finally being able to rest for a few minutes. We are going after Fu. Shino simply said and started walking away. Wait for me to come back, Shino said, and Gara nodded in acknowledgement. Mother, go. His mother interrupted him. Give them the hell for me. His mother smiled sadly, and Shino nodded. Abarame Hive. Shino arrived at the center of the woods surrounding his compound. He slowly entered the room and made his way towards the center of the room. As he walked, he looked around to see several hives all around the room. Here was where they grew their bugs, and where they performed the ceremony on the newborn. Shino stopped right in front of a large box. It was just an ordinary box, standing in a simple wooden desk. While seemingly plain, this box had etched a single word on the front. Forbidden. Shino paid no second thought and opened the box, taking the jar out and gently lowering it to the table. Shino placed a hand on the lid and hesitated ever so slightly, before picking up the jar and smashing it on the ground. As the jar shattered on the hard floor, a large swarm of bugs burst from it, immediately assessing the threat and completely covering Shino from head to toe in a shroud of darkness. Shino gritted his teeth in pain, but did not waver for even a second on his decision. You took my father from me, Shino said, dropping to his knees. But with you, I will rescue you, Fu, Shino replied, his eyes burning with fire and the bugs seemed to feel his power and determination. The swarm slowed down and began slowly flying around him. The bugs started to land softly on him and started slithering their way into his skin. Shino dropped his black goggles to the ground and slowly stood up. His skin was now a deep purple and his eyes shining a bright silver. Let's go hunting. I'm